being here today. And I want to thank uh, Ted Zilstra for hosting us here at Brayside Auto, here in the great riding of Calgary Glenmore. My name's Whitney Isaac, and I'm proud to be running for re-election in Calgary Glenmore, and very happy to be joined here today by fellow candidates Mike Ellis, Miles McDougall, Pamela Rath, Amanpreet Singh Gill, and my good friend Grant Hunter is here from Tabor Warner today. In 2019, Albertans decided that they had had enough of the job-killing policies of the NDP. We spent the last four years correcting their mistakes and getting our province back on track. We cut taxes and have made a commitment to keep them low. We kick-started new areas of the economy to attract whole new realms of jobs and investments. We restored investor confidence in our province and brought back the Alberta advantage. Thanks to those efforts and the hard work of all Albertans, Alberta's economy has momentum again. Albertans are finding work. Canadians moving to Alberta from other provinces are coming here in droves. And companies from around the world are investing in Alberta. If re-elected, we would keep our foot on the gas and continue telling Alberta's story to the world. And we will do that under the strong leadership of the woman that I am pleased to be introducing today. She's wholly devoted to creating a stronger, safer, more affordable future that keeps Alberta moving forward. It's my honour to introduce the leader of the United Conservative Party and the 18th Premier of Alberta. Please welcome Danielle Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Whitney. I think I'm the 19th Premier of Alberta. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, I've got Mark. I've got a thumbs up from Markusov, and he would know. So thank you for uh, the introduction, Whitney, and thank you to Ted for hosting us at your shop today. I also want to thank the uh, the members of our amazing UCP team who are here with us today, and thank you to everyone for joining us here today as we announce our plan to create jobs, diversify the economy, and keep Alberta moving forward. On Monday, I committed that a re-elected United Conservative government would keep Alberta affordable by cutting taxes for all Albertans saving each taxpayer up to $760 and extending the 13 cent per litre fuel tax holiday until the end of the year. And today I'm pleased to talk about how a UCP government would continue our path of economic growth, investment attraction and job creation. Our economy has momentum again. It's diversifying. Albertans are finding work and Canadians are moving to Alberta in rates not seen in years. For four consecutive years, Alberta smashed venture capital records, attracting $729 million in 2022, a 30% increase over 2021's record-breaking year. In the first quarter of 2023, over 5,220 new businesses incorporated in Alberta. Under the UCP government, global companies have made landmark investments demonstrating the massive potential and opportunity we have in Alberta. We've seen our film and television industry take off, attracting huge projects like HBO's The Last of Us and Ghostbusters Afterlife. Alberta is poised to lead the country in development of renewable energy, working alongside our traditional energy sources. We're leading the country in hydrogen production, and with our hydrogen roadmap, we are well on our way to becoming a global leader in clean, low-cost hydrogen. With our new agri-processing investment tax credit, Alberta is one of the top locations to meet the increasing demand of the growing food processing sector. Airlines are flocking to invest in Alberta, with both WestJet and Lynx making Calgary their home base, De Havilland building its next airplane manufacturing plant just east of Calgary, and major banks have projected Alberta will lead the country in growth in 2023. A re-elected UCP government would be committed to keeping this momentum going with a plan to make our economy more resilient while building on our strengths. We are providing Albertans with a commitment to not raise business taxes on job creators or impose job killing regulations. We want Albertans to know that their jobs are secure. We want you to know that there will be opportunity for your children and grandchildren. That is why I'm proud to announce a number of initiatives today, starting with the Alberta Job Growth and Diversification Strategy, the United Conservative Party's forward-looking plan to continue growing our economy, create new opportunities, and move the province and Alberta families forward. To keep our economy growing, we need skilled workers for our new and existing industries. And not only do we want to attract them, we want to keep them here. Our Alberta is Calling campaign has had fantastic success, and we want to keep that going. As part of the strategy, 
a UCP government will launch the Alberta is calling signing bonus for targeted skilled trades and professions where we have labor shortages, including healthcare, childcare, and trades. Eligible newcomers will receive a $1,200 payment after their first full year of living here. We will also be encouraging bright young Albertans in these same fields to stay here after graduation by introducing an Alberta graduation retention tax credit. So to encourage these students to stay and live in Alberta after graduation, this program will credit back a significant portion of education costs through a non-refundable tax credit between $3,000 and $10,000, depending on the program in question. This non-refundable tax credit will encourage graduates to stay and work within Alberta. But we can do more to attract workers in the skilled trades and professions. We need to eliminate barriers that block professionally trained workers from provinces and countries from applying for the jobs Alberta needs filled. The UCP government made changes to the Labour Mobility Act to help new Albertans get to work more quickly in their chosen professions so that they can support their families. But we need to do more. A re-elected UCP government will build on the, this work to streamline the certification of skilled trades and healthcare workers. Alberta will become the national leader in fast-tracking credentials recognition, including auto-credentialing. We will ramp up the fast-tracking of credentials we began earlier this year for doctors and nurses. And we will work with professional bodies to ensure that there aren't any unreasonable barriers in timelines for approving credentials for workers in any areas, but especially in those areas that our economy needs. This also includes expanding auto-credentialing from provinces and countries with similar standards and providing reasonable pathways for other internationally trained professionals to practice their profession in Alberta. The Alberta Job Growth and Diversification Strategy won't just fill the jobs of today, but will create the opportunities of tomorrow. A re-elected UCP government will accelerate the diversification of Alberta's economy by creating tens of thousands of quality jobs through targeted strategic investments across numerous Alberta industries. We will provide an additional $100 million to the Alberta Enterprise Corporation to attract more venture, capital, cap, more venture capital investments. And we'll, we will extend the, their authority to allow $25 million for Indigenous equity venture capital funds to spur equity venture capital investments with Indigenous partners. We will continue empowering Indigenous entrepreneurs by also doubling the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation's loan capacity from $1 billion to $2 billion. And we will expand its eligibility to manufacturing, healthcare, technology, and tourism. A re-elected UCP government will also leverage the new agri-processing investment tax credit and look to expand it to forestry and other manufacturing sectors to maintain Alberta's competitive advantage. And we will expand the feeder assistance loan guarantee limit from $2 million to $3 million to help agriculture producers compete in a higher priced environment. We will develop programs similar to the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program to attract investment in other capital-intensive technologies like carbon capture utilization and storage, hydrogen, geothermal, and biomass. And we will move concierge and wayfinding services for businesses to the newly expanded Regional Economic Development Alliances. We will also continue to promote Alberta's increased and highly successful film and television tax credit to keep attracting major projects like The Last of Us to Alberta. United Conservatives are committed to growing the economy, attracting more skilled workers, and making Alberta more affordable so young people can see themselves staying and growing their families right here. Unlike the NDP leader who has said she will raise taxes on businesses, sending investment fleeing along, away from the province and the jobs along with it, the choice is clear. Do you want a government focused on building a strong, stable Alberta? An Alberta focused on job creation, growing the economy and attracting investment? A government focused on stability for your families and businesses? A government you can count on to keep your taxes low and not overburden you with arbitrary and excessive red tape? Or do you want to go backward with the NDP who would raise taxes and would introduce more red tape that would drive away businesses, jobs, and investment? We can't afford to put Alberta's growth and opportunity at risk with the investment and job-crushing policies of the NDP. 
Our responsible economic plan has been working, and the Alberta Job Growth and Diversification Strategy will continue moving Alberta forward. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, we'll get to all of the questions on the floor first. If I just ask anybody that wants to ask a question to line up with the mic. Uh, one, uh, your name, outlet, and one question. We have quite a few questions today, so we'd like to get through all of them. Go ahead. Is his mic on? I can't hear him very well. Can somebody turn his mic on? Try again, Jonathan. Okay. Oh, I think, got it now? Hello, Premier Smith, Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. One of your promises during the Alberta United Conservative Party leadership race was to add vaccine status to the Alberta Human Rights Act. Where do you stand on that issue now? We're not going to do that. Uh, I invited uh, Preston Manning to take a look at the full suite of legislative changes that might be made for a future pandemic. His report is going to be uh, interim, delivered sometime in June or July, I believe, and then the final report in November. And we will look at the recommendations and make a decision at that time. Thank you. All right. This doesn't work. Good morning, uh, Ms. Smith. Take Back Alberta uh, claims they got rid of Jason Kenney, uh, they helped elect you, they elected half the board of the, uh, of the UCP. Uh, for crying out loud, you even attended uh, David Parker, the leader's wedding. What influence does Take Back Alberta have on the United Conservative Party? All of our uh, member pass policy is a one member, one vote policy. Every person is welcome to come forward and put their name forward. And we've got, I think, a diversity of views on our, our boards as well as among our candidates. And I, I welcome that. I think that's very positive. I personally think that uh, the NDP has a lot more to answer for. They give direct seats on the Provincial Council to the Alberta Federation of Labour, in addition to giving seats on the Provincial Governing Council to the heads of all of the unions operating in Alberta, including federal unions. They have a structure that as soon as you buy a membership in the Alberta Party, the Alberta-based party, it becomes the wing of the federal party. So they are integrated with the federal decision-making body, which is Jagmeet Singh. And I think it's part of the reason you can see why Rachel Notley is supportive of the, the Notley Singh, uh, the, the, or the Singh uh, Trudeau coalition at the federal level, including the net zero electricity grid, which she has openly stated she supports, getting to net zero on our electricity grid by 2035, which we announced and showed yesterday would cost $87 billion, $52 billion in direct costs, which would increase electricity bills 40%. So this is part of the reason I think we should be very, very concerned about the influence on the NDP, not only of the unions that are embedded in their decision-making process and their delegate status and choose their leader, quite frankly, uh, as well as the, uh, the influence of Jagmeet Singh on the policies of Rachel Notley. I, I question whether she works for Albertans or whether she works for her federal leader. And I would say in a one-member, one-vote party, one-member, one-vote party, there is, there is not even anything close to that level of, of, uh, of influence. So what is your I've got lots of friends. <laughs> All right, Tim Brooks, CTV, I want to talk about that net zero plan. Yeah. Um, one of the report authors that your party cited asked for a correction last night. Tweets are still up, attack ads are still up, video is still up on YouTube citing the numbers that the report author says is inaccurate. So I just want to know, do you think it's time to issue a little bit more of a widespread correction? And if not, is it misleading to voters? No, we don't need to issue a correction. We uh, had Navius issue a clarification because they thought that we were attributing the entire $87 billion cost simply to their report. We were not. We were quoting two different reports. One report was the direct cost that the Alberta electric system operator said it would cost to get to net zero by, 20, by 2035. That is $52 billion, which would represent a 40% increase on electricity bills. And then the Navius report was talking about the knock-on effect, the opportunity cost that would be in addition to that because of the, of the, of the direction in that investment. So the two together come to $87 billion. Um, and we worked on a joint statement that is you're happy to go out and look at Navius's website as well as our own. And, that, and they agree with that interpretation. So no, we don't need to issue a correction. 
Jason Herring, Calgary Herald. Um, in late April, we learned the Crown Prosecution Service would not prosecute an Edmonton police officer who kicked an Indigenous teenager uh, named Pacey Dumas in the head during an arrest, and that's despite ACERT finding there were reasonable grounds to believe an offence may have been committed by the officer. The Crown says the case was not winnable, but they're refusing to answer specifics about how they arrived at that conclusion. Uh, obviously, the Crown's independent, but what do you say to people upset with the decision and the message it sends, and would you support a clear statement rule requiring the, the, that, that the Crown would uh, issue a statement explaining such decisions like they have in BC? Hmm. I, uh, I don't know that particular case, but I can tell you that we have had concerns about excessive use of force, and it's part of the reason why our Public Safety and Emergency Services Minister, Mike Ellis, created um, a, a separate civilian oversight of all of our police forces, uh, including our CMP. And so we, uh, we also have the, op the ability to appoint uh, provincial members to those commissions, once again, to be able to give additional oversight. But on that particular case, I, I would ask for you to follow up with Becca, and maybe you can get a, a statement from, uh, from Minister Ellis uh, or Minister Shandro to see if there's uh, any further direction that they would take. Hi there, uh, Adam McVicker with uh, Global News. Uh, we have put out a poll this morning, uh, polling results that no surprise show that um, affordability is, the, is by far the biggest issue for Albertans in this election. I was wondering what kind of assurances you could give to Albertans about the, riot, the you know, increasing cost of living, giving what's in control and not in control of the provincial government. Part of the, the reason why we came through with our affordability uh, action plan was exactly this reason. We had been hearing how difficult it was for young families to manage their grocery bill costs, for seniors to manage their pharmaceutical costs, and for everyone to manage the cost of electricity and home heating, as well as filling up uh, on gas and diesel. And so we brought through our $600 affordability payments. We re-indexed a number of different uh, programs so that that could keep up with inflation. We re-indexed taxes. We gave a reprieve on the fuel tax, 13 cents a litre. We announced that we'll be extending that to the end of this year. Uh, and as well, we put in subsidies to, to put in uh, for electricity as well as a gas price guarantee for natural gas. And, and uh, it's, it's worked. It's moderated the costs of everything because when you can reduce the cost of energy which goes into everything it reduces the cost across the board my understanding is that we're at about a 3.3 percent inflation rate which is better than the rest of the country and we're we stand by ready to do more if if we have to uh, we wanted to make sure that there was continuity until june that allows for us to see whether inflation is going to be moderating whether the changes to the interest rate is going to bring that down but we we will do more if we need to and we'll, we'll make the decision at that time but i'm I'm glad that we have been able to do a number of things that would counteract the, uh, the, uh, the federal carbon tax, which, as you know, increased on April 1st. It's now 14 cents a litre with the full support of the NDP. And um, when, when we talk about affordability, these are the, the things that we are concerned about, especially since we're talking today about being able to attract jobs and workers here. When the ability to attract jobs and workers here not only include the kind of investment tax credits that we're talking about, but also making life more affordable. Businesses need to have affordable energy so that they can set up shop. Consumers and, and employees need to have affordable energy so that they have more money in their pockets and also so that they can uh, keep more of what they earn. So those are the reasons why these two things are are. are connected. We have to be able to keep more people here, but the best way that we can keep people here is by ensuring that we have the lowest inflation in the country and ensuring that we are reducing the cost of, of all, all, all of the energy inputs. Alex Dollywell, Rebel News. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Um, so late last year, Onion Lake Cree First Nation took the Alberta government to court over the Sovereignty Act. They say that the province has uh, not uh, done sufficient consultations with Indigenous uh, Albertans um, and they claim the act uh, infringes upon their freedom and agency. Uh, can you, Premier, speak more to the consultation efforts done by your government with Indigenous Albertans on the Sovereignty Act? The, uh, the, the very, if you look in the very first couple of clauses of that act, you will see it affirms the uh, section 
uh, I think it's Section 35 rights of our Indigenous peoples, affirms that uh, they, uh, the treaty rights of our Indigenous peoples, and the, the Act was never about interfering or impacting those rights at all. It was about um, talking about our, uh, Alberta's relationship with Ottawa, which is defined under Section 92 and 92A of the Constitution. But I can say that we have a, a tremendously positive relationship with First Nations as a result of some of the measures that we've taken. Our Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation Loan Guarantee Program has been incredibly successful. There's a group of 23 First Nations who bought into a pipeline structure in Northern Alberta. They're getting an 11.65% stake. It's going to create long-term diversified uh, revenue streams. And we want to do more of that. Uh, so that's part of the reason why we're announcing an expansion to this program today, so that it's not just a billion dollars. We can do loan guarantees up to $2 billion. And we're going to continue to support our Indigenous communities that way, because we think economic reconciliation is going to be foundational to having true reconciliation with our First Peoples. Adam Sos, Rebel News. Uh, one of the potential causes of dis divide in the UCP over the past few years has been the inability of MLAs, uh, nominally Drew Barnes, Todd Lowen, to name a few, to speak out when they disagree with the leadership or when they have personal concerns. Under Danielle Smith UCP, will MLAs be able to speak out and represent their constituents? Well, you know, I, 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 I prefer to be, have a leadership style where um, our, if anyone has a concern, they can raise it with me directly. And I'm very open to talking about how we can accommodate different concerns. We have an op open and robust uh, caucus discussion. And we also have um, uh, the ability to, to vote freely in our, our caucus and, and our cabinet. I, I don't think we've encountered any circumstances under my leadership where we haven't been able to resolve our, our issues around uh, certain circumstances or certain pieces of legislation. Um, but it seems to me like that process is working and I'm going to continue working because I think if you treat people with respect, they will treat you back with respect. So that's just my, my leadership style. I'm, I'd, I'd need a specific example um, if there's anything in particular that you think that, uh, that hasn't, hasn't lived up to that. But I, I, think our, I think our MLAs are really excited that we're part of a united conservative movement. They have a lot of input on, in the decisions that we're bringing forward. I can tell you some of the issues that we brought forward today. The agri uh, Agri-Food Processing Tax Credit came out on the campaign trail when, when Rebecca Schultz said we need to do this, and we did it. Uh, we, we have a number of our, um, of our, uh, our MLAs who are concerned that we're not recognizing international credentials. It's the reason why we're going to develop a fast track to affirming those. It's, uh, everybody has raised concern about how do we keep our kids here, our graduates here. And those are the issues that come out through the, the caucus and cabinet process. And so we're announcing a, a tax credit today that will keep more of our graduates here and attract more people here. So all of these things uh, are, are, are really generated from the great ideas of my caucus. I think we've got a fabulous relationship and I'm gonna keep that going. Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Um, I think pollsters are unanimous in saying it's going to be a tight race, particularly in Calgary. Uh, how do you plan to gain the support of voters who may have voted for Alison Redford, who may have voted for Jim Prentice, and who may have voted for Jason Kenney, but are still undecided, still thinking about who to vote for? So how are you planning to get their vote and do you see some of the people who supported you in your leadership race as an asset or a liability for candidates in Calgary who are going to the door asking for votes? Well, I would, I would say that when you, when you look at how diverse our communities are, and that includes um, every community, Calgary maybe particularly, we, we know that we have to create a, an environment that is going to, to build on that diversity, attract more people. And I think that that's part of what people are seeing with our diverse caucus. If you look at the number of candidates that we have, we, we have half of our, our caucus or half of our candidates either come from a, a diverse background or are women. That I think is going to demonstrate that our caucus has that broad base of support. I think that's really important. Uh, when we put forward the kind of ideas like we have today about how we're going to keep kids here, that's an everybody issue. Uh, making sure that when kids graduate from school that they see the opportunity here. I think I, I hear about that from parents regardless of what their political perspective is. Uh, the, I know so many people who have friends who have come here from 
from other places and we don't recognize their, their credentials so they can work in their area of expertise. I found that frustrating. I've been finding that frustrating since I started advocating on this in, 20, in 2006. And this is part of the reason why we're, we're going to make sure that we are that open and welcoming community. So I think those are all uh, issues that, that matter to everyone. I think they may, may matter particularly to Calgary because it's, it is such a, a diverse community. And I think it, it is one of those issues that, that reaches across the spectrum and we've got to do more to, to address those issues. That's why we're announcing the decisions that we are today. Evelyn Asselin, Radio-Canada. Indigenous leaders downstream of the oil center calling for the Alberta Energy Regulator to be disbanded and replaced uh, by a new regulator, regulatory body uh, with greater Indigenous input. Do you agree with that demand and will the UCP reform the AER if re-elected? I know that the AER is going through a process of an external review that we, we have to, to make sure that when instant instances happen where there is a, um, when they have to issue an order, that there is better communication. I think we've learned that uh, through not only the communication with the communities, but also communication with our, our friends in, uh, in Northwest Territories. That, that's pretty loud and clear. So as I understand it, they're going to be uh, in the middle of an independent review to get some of that advice about how they can improve their processes. And I would welcome reforms. I would, I would welcome the, that, that process to see how we can improve. I've always said that the, the solution on any time, type of, of instance that occurs is, is a radical, uh, radical transparency. That we, we need to make sure everybody feels confident, everybody feels safe, everybody feels uh, that they can have trust. And if we can make improvements, certainly we're open to them. All right, operator, let's go to the first caller, please. Adam Toy, Global News. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to um, ch touch back on this uh, net zero uh, claim that you uh, that your party put out yesterday. Uh, 87 billion sounds like a lot, but Navius's own uh, report said that it would have a largely negligible impact of GDP growth. You say that you don't feel like you don't need to have a, a, a correction, um, but a, as a percentage of GDP growth, it's not very large. What's your response to that? Well, let me lead, read to you what uh, we put out on Twitter yesterday. You might not have the most recent information, Adam. Navius Research asked us to describe this issue this way, spending $52 billion, as ISO identifies, to decarbonize the electricity sector between now and 2040 results in a cumulative reduction in Alberta's GDP of about $35 billion in 2015 Canadian real dollars. Navius says, yes, this is the correct interpretation of our model. Thank you for clarifying. So we have two reports that we went out with. One was the electric system operator report saying that it would have a 52, we'd have to invest $52 billion to get to a net zero power grid that will increase electricity prices for consumers by 40%. And then Navius was asked what the uh, additional effect would be in reducing GDP, and they said it would have a cumulative effect of reducing GDP by $35 billion. So those two numbers added together is $87 billion. And I think uh, what people are, especially after people got through this most recent um, th this most recent winter season, looking at their, at their power bills. A lot of the NDP decisions are coming home to roost. The fact that they, they phased out coal early, there was, there was one coal plant that had only been operation for six months before it was phased out to natural gas. And as a result, there was, there was billions of dollars of stranded costs that then had to be worked into ratepayers' bills. They've, we have also seen an overbuild of the transmission system. That's why transmission and distribution charges are so high on people's power bills. Now, look at what you just saw this past winter and add 40% to that. And I would tell you that that is not going to be affordable for, uh, for people on fixed income. It's not going to be affordable for renters. It's not going to be affordable for, for everyday families. And that is why uh, when, when the NDP blithely states they're going to follow Stephen Guibault's plan of getting to a net zero power grid by 2035. People need to know it is the most expensive campaign promise that has been put forward in this election. It's going to have a huge impact on affordability. And so I would just invite you to look at both of those reports and, and you can judge for yourself. Okay, operator, let's go to the next caller. Jeremy Thompson, CP. Uh, hi, uh, Ms. Smith. This, this electricity grid stuff, you know, it, it, well, well, the second report does say 
there will be a $35 billion, you know, impact on, uh, on, on GDP. It also says that impact, just given the, um, given the, uh, given what sort of the original numbers it was working with and the margin of error in the report, it, it considers that to be negligible. It also points out that the AESO numbers that were originally worked with were already inflated and then potentially inflated even further. So I guess, are, are you concerned that sharing doctor numbers like that further erodes public trust? Well, I, I dispute the way you're describing it. Our Alberta electric system operator we rely on them to give us advice as we're looking forward on these policy decisions. And when they say that it's a $52 billion cost that's going to increase electricity by 40%, I think people need to know that. Uh, and if you don't, uh, and, uh, and I must say, um, maybe we should also look at what Nancy Southern has said. She knows a thing or two about the electricity business and the natural gas. She knows a thing or two as well about how home heating is going to be impacted uh, just on uh, May the 3rd, let me tell you what she had to say. So many of you may not be aware of Canada's proposed clean electricity regulations. Those are the ones we're talking about. It mandates a net zero electrical grid for all provinces by 2035. That's just 12 years away. Less than 12 years away. You may also not be aware of the graph green build strategy, which envisions a combination of regulatory standards and retrofit incentives to entirely eliminate the role of natural gas heating for gas appliances, furnaces, in all homes and businesses right across Canada to be done in 12 years. So she's very aware of the impact of the clean electricity regs that can be put in place or is, uh, that the federal government proposes to put in place and Rachel Notley proposes to put in place by 12 years. She's also aware that the federal government wants to completely phase out natural gas as well. And do you know what, want to know how much that's going to cost? She says, Alberta's grid has 15 gigawatts, 15,000 megawatts of installed power. To completely replace natural gas, that would require 50 gigawatts of additional power. That's going to cost another $75 billion to be able to do that. This is not non-trivial numbers. So now if we want to add this, we've got $52 billion to get to a net zero power grid, $75 billion to be able to completely phase out natural gas, and then the knock-on effect from GDP, a minimum of, of $35 billion. We probably now have to get them to adjust that on the basis of natural gas also being proposed to be phased out by, by, by 2035. That is, the federal, that is the federal aspiration. They have been very clear about that. They are intending to micromanage every aspect of Alberta's economy. We, at the same time, are trying to get LNG export internationally. So we're trying to get our LNG to the world at the same time as the federal government, with Rachel Notley backing them up, wants to phase out both of these things. It is costly. We can't, we, can't, we can't mince words about this. This is why we put forward an emissions plan that would get us to 2050. So at least we have the opportunity for new technology to develop. So we can get carbon capture utilization in stores. So we can get hydrogen. So that we can get small modular nuclear. I'm going to tell you, 2035 aspirations, 12 years from now, it is not achievable. It will be massively costly to our consumers. And we cannot mince words about that. This is what the Rachel Notley agenda is. This is what the federal NDP liberal agenda is, and this is why this election is so important. We have to make sure people understand just how much it's going to cost them. You can't, on the one hand, say you care so much about affordability and then propose putting these kinds of costs on people for their home heating in winter, for their electricity, uh, the, and the constant increase in the carbon tax, which Rachel Notley once again has not disputed. It's going up 300%. You think that the cost of, of gasoline and diesel is bad now? Imagine what it's going to be when we see a threefold increase in the cost of the, of, the fuel, of the fuel taxes on gasoline and diesel. This is, we need a plan that is going to be achievable. The kind of things that we are hearing put forward by Stephen Gabot, Jagmeet Singh, and Rachel Notley are not achievable. All right, operator, we have time for one more caller. Grant Thompson, Toronto Star. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, later today, about an hour from now, or half an hour from now, um, Rachel Notley, leader of the NDP, is going to speak, she says, directly to Conservatives who are considering voting UC, uh, sorry, voting for the NDP for the first time. I was wondering, do you have a strategy to reach out to you Democrats to convince them to vote for the 
the um, UCP for the first time. Absolutely. We have a job strategy. When you look at the, the kind of jobs that we are talking about under this strategy, I know that uh, there's a lot of blue collar workers um, who are in the building trades and other Red Seal trades. This, uh, this program that we're announcing today, we would make sure that anyone who are coming here in those skilled designated professions get $1,200 in the first full year that they're here. Anyone who's graduating from a one-year certificate program would get a $3,000 tuition credit. Two to three years would be $5,000. We've got doctors and registered nurses, um, including RN, psychs, nurse practitioners, and midwives that would get a $10,000 rebate. So I would say that whether you are a blue-collar worker or whether you are a frontline nurse or other health professional, th these are the kind of things that are gonna make a real difference in people's lives. These are the kind of reasons why people will wanna to come to Alberta. And these are the reasons why we wanna continue so supporting the, those who, who wanna to, to move here. Our Alberta is calling, campaign is working. And it's because people wanna be here to enjoy the lowest tax jurisdiction in the country. So you couple this with our low tax guarantee, uh, so couple this as well with the fact that we're bringing in a new 8% uh, uh, income tax rate and add on top of that these additional incentives. I, I would think that any union member who had been considering voting for the NDP should think twice. The NDP instead, with their ideological approach on resource revenue, it will cost blue collar jobs. It will cause blue collar jobs to no longer exist with that early phase out. That is the agenda of the NDP. Why would any blue collar worker, why would any of them support the NDP? Why would, why would any uh, frontline health professional support the NDP? They had four years to work on, on making changes to the healthcare system, they failed. We, we put changes in place that are already making a difference on the front line. Just ask any paramedic how different it is today when they no longer effectively have red alerts um, versus when it was four or five months ago when they were sitting at our, our emergency rooms 15 to 20 ambulances deep. I would say that those are the reasons why uh, union supporters should vote for the, the UCP. We care about them. We're here for them. And uh, more help is on the way. Thanks, everybody.